Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Good morning. Y'all give them a hand. Amen. Well, how are you this morning? Y'all glad to be here? Hey, I've been thinking, you know, every decision has consequences. Do you know that? Doesn't matter how big they are, doesn't matter how small they are, every decision has consequences. In fact, some of you are going to leave here today and you're going to make decisions as soon as you walk out the door. In fact, a decision that most of you are going to make today is this one thing. Where are we going to eat? And, and let me tell you what you're not going to do. You're not going to call the elders and have them pray over you and anoint you with oil. Uh, you might have a discussion because if it goes like my house, hey, where do you want to eat? I don't care. Well, where do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't care. I don't know. And you, so I know that kind of takes place. And so, you know, every decision has consequences. But here's what I know. Most of you in this room are going to go home and eat, right? And another decision you're going to make. You're going to get in the car and you're going to choose a radio station or you're going to turn it off. And guess what? You're not going to call a group of committee together and put a task force together and make a decision, what radio station am I going to listen to? Because if you love Jesus, you're going to listen to 96.1 Classic Rock, amen? Because that's if you love Jesus, right? And so you're going to make these decisions, but here's what I know, every decision has consequences. No matter how small. Let me give you a small decision. In fact, you may want to do this every day, maybe twice a day, and it's simply this, brush your teeth, Amen. Yeah. Here's another one. Take a shower every day. Now, if you're sitting by somebody that didn't take a shower, raise their hand. Amen? Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is. There's being a parent and raising kids. Our kids kind of go through that season where it's like, it's like it's a sin to be clean. You know, you ask them to take a shower and it's like, no, I don't want to be clean. You're like, really? You don't want to be clean? Well, wow. You know? Um, so, you know, it's just, and, and let's say if you're single in the room and you want to get married, shower twice a day. Okay? Just say it. And brush your teeth. <laughs> See, decisions matter. It does not matter how big or how little or unknown, because even unseen decisions that nobody knows about matters. Over the last few weeks, we've been honored to get to honor some of you uh, that serve here at Summit Heights. And, and some of you serve in ways that nobody even knows. In fact, they don't even know your name. And, 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 and all the things that happen at Summit Heights happens because of a thousand little decisions. A thousand little decisions. Some of you just show up and all of this takes place and all of this is here and all the music's done and the screens and, and the air conditioner and sometimes it's too cold, sometimes it's too But all this happens because there's decisions made every week for, for this to take place. But you know, here's something interesting. The reason we're here in Hawkins, America, the reason we're here in the middle of the cow pasture it's because of some unnamed guys found in Acts chapter 11. That's why we're here. In fact, you might even say it's their fault, but it's their effort of why we're here today. If these men had not left, left the Jewish people and gone to the Gentiles and planted the church, we wouldn't be here today. Now, I know God would have used somebody else. He would have raised up somebody. I get that. But there's a group of guys I found this last week in Acts chapter 11. In fact, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, your um, apps and that. It's in, a, it, and it's in a city called Antioch, and we'll learn more about that in just a minute. But it, it's pretty cool how the church got going right here in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. It says, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen. See, what was happening is a church at the time was scattered because there was a group of people that really understood what Jesus said, where Jesus said, I am the lamb to take 
take away the sins of the world. And actually, Jesus didn't say that. John the Baptist did. And when John the Baptist said it, Jesus goes, you're right, I am. I'm the one that's going to take away the sin. And so you don't need the blood of goats. You don't need the blood of bulls. You don't need the priest system. You don't need all the sacrifice, sacrificial system. In fact, you don't need the priest. And Stephen came along and he believed that and he, and he began to proclaim that. As you can imagine, when you start telling the priest, we don't need you anymore, that whole system, those boys were not happy. And so what they did was, they did the only thing they could do, they killed him. And the church began to... to, to Scatter, And so we find this here in, in Acts chapter 11, and they went to Phoenicia, which is the land of the palm tree. It's modern day Lebanon that we know about today. It's this beautiful place in the Mediterranean where they began to scatter out and off the islands of the Mediterranean there in Africa. And, and the church began to, to spread out. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, let's read it again. It says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word on only among the Jews, because that's what most folks did. They, they just went to the Jews, because remember the Jews had been talking about this Messiah that was coming all along. And, and so these guys started spreading out and going to these synagogues and going, you know all the sacrificial system you've been doing and all this stuff and all these priests and all these things you've been getting ready for? Well, guess what? We're going to help you connect the dots. And they begin to connect the dots from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And lo and behold, they began to believe. And Jews were saved. And they went primarily to those people and those synagogues. And there's no problem with that. In fact, Paul repeats that pattern all through the book of Acts. But what you see is that God doesn't just love Jewish people. He loves non-Jewish people as well. And we're going to see that this morning. He always has. He always will. You know, when I was in Israel in 09, one of the things that the Jews still don't understand, that today, if they reject God's provision for the Messiah, that they will be separated from God. And the same thing for non-Jews, for us. If we reject the provision of God in Jesus Christ, we will be separated. But there was a group of individuals there that we look around and we see in verse 20. And they said, you know, the synagogues are kind of covered. So let's go somewhere else. Let's go somewhere else and tell the good news. Look at, look at verse 20. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch. And begin to speak to Greeks also. That's the non-Jewish. Those, those of you that don't have any Jewish blood whatsoever in them. Telling them the good news about Jesus. See, this is the whole book of Acts. Now, the whole book of Acts was about going and spreading the church. Did this thing just get really loud? It went out? And then it came back. And then it came back. Okay, man, this is like twice in the sermon. Anyway, um, the whole book of Acts is about the church spreading. It's, it's, it's gracious to see how God didn't just want the Jews. He wanted all men to be saved. And if you go back and you look in the, in the, in the book of Acts, he starts by having Philip go up to Samaria, which is a station, nation state of half Jews and, and half Gentiles. And when Israel was brought out of exile, they, they were there with the Babylonians. And when, before God brought them back, they intermarried into the Babylonians. And so uh, they, they weren't really full Jews. And so when they came back, the Jewish people didn't really like them because they were tainted and they didn't have the full blood. And, and so they lived there in the area of Samaria and they were called Samarians or Samaritans. And, and so they had this whole idea, well, well, what God does, he sends Philip there to Samaria and lo and behold, Behold, when he began to share about all that God had done, lo and behold, they started receiving Jesus. They started proclaiming the good news. You know, Jesus was interested because he wasn't worried about your skin color or your race or anything else. I love that when Jesus walked the earth, he didn't care if you're a Samaritan, Jew, or whatever. He would go wherever they were because he loves all people. He knew that we were all sinners. In fact, a good Jew would never go through Samaria, and Jesus instead just walked right through it. A good Jew would go all around and go out of his way to never walk through Samaria. But Jesus walked right through because he loved them. So Philip goes to Samaria, and they receive the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 8, Peter and John come up and go, man, what in the world's going on here? These people are receiving the same spirit that we received. And oh, big God loves Jews. And no, that uh, really are, not, are completely Jewish. It's amazing. I'll be, he loves people different from us. And so the church started spreading. Then in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius comes along. And then Acts chapter 11, we start seeing these guys who say, you know what? The Jewish people are getting this, so we got to go somewhere else. And here's what's amazing to me. Here's what's incredible to me when you read through But we're in Acts chapter 11. And finally, people are starting to go, wow, this is what God really wants. He doesn't want just the Jews. He wants everybody. And they start doing it. It's amazing. 
for the first time, somebody's getting what God's always wanted. And when you think of great men and women of God that, that have been busy about, uh, you know, initiating and taking grace and mercy to the lost, and the people that don't have it, you know, I, I think about Jim Elliott. I remember reading about him in college and Jim going to South America and ended up losing his life for his faith. And I think about those guys or maybe even Hudson Taylor who went to China or Eric Liddell from Chariots of Fire. Those guys had those big names that we know. But you know the first folks to ever get busy about spreading the church? We know those names. If you don't, you need to look at them. We don't even know their names. The guys who, the reason we're here in their effort, we don't even know their names. They're just some guys from Cyprus and Cyrene. Look at it again. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is amazing to me. Do you know we're going to get to heaven someday for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus? And we're going to walk up and go, hey, dude, who are you? I don't know. We're just some guys from Cyprus and Cyrene. <gasps> You're the guys. I guess we are. That's who we are. Yeah. We don't know their names. And we look at that, it's amazing for me. Sometimes I wonder why their names aren't recorded in the scripture. And I think the reason is, is because many of us want to seek fame and fortune from the celebration of men. We want people to know our name. And I love it that God just, we're right in the middle of this, says, you know what? Just because people know your name doesn't mean you're faithful. <laughs> That you and I could actually live a way that we don't seek to be noticed by men, but to be used mightily by God. The older I get, the more I want to be less known. And the more I want Jesus to be known. It used to be when I was in my 20s, I wanted to be the next mega church pastor. And the older I get, the more I just want to go, it's about Jesus. I, I'm really not that good. And if you knew me, you feel me? See, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. In Hebrews 6, verse 10, I love this. I stumbled on this this week. In fact, I think I put I love this on the stage. Oh, yes, in this verse I love. Uh, I forgot to pull that out. It says, for God is not unjust. Look what he says. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for believers as you still do. In other words, listen to me. People may not know all of what you do, but the Lord does, if you're being faithful to him. That God has noticed. You might be just some guy or girl from Holly Lake or Quitman or, or from Big Sandy or, or Mineola. You may just be that single mom or single again, but you're just being faithful. You see, the only one who needs to notice you has already noticed you. I love it that Luke here just says some guys from Cyrene and Cyprus and that Luke says the only historian that really wants to make sure knows you. Listen to me. He knows you. God sees what you're doing. God sees and it's noticeable. And I don't know about you, but that helps me. That helps me that I don't have to be noticed by men. I can just seek to be used by God mightily to get up every morning and just say, God, I want to see you lifted up. It's not about me. I want you. In verse 20, it says, some of them, however, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, and they began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. You, you want to be mighty? You, you want to be mighty in the kingdom? I know some of you, you do. And, and Let me tell you how you're mighty. Look at these guys. These guys are mighty because they simply just went and told the good news of Jesus. They didn't care where they were. They didn't care what was going on around them. We're just going to learn about Antioch in just a minute. Because see, the city of Antioch was one of the three greatest cities of this time. There was, there was Antioch, there was Rome, and then there was Alexandria. And we kind of know about these Greek cities back in those times. And Antioch was kind of known for, it's, 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 it's this incredible, luxurious immorality. Think Vegas, amen? I mean, they, they had chariot races there. They could go and watch the chariot races, and they could just go out and just live 24 hours of just pure immorality. 24 hours a day. And in Antioch, just outside of the city, it's not only famous for their chariot races and their immorality, just outside the city was the Temple of Daphne. Now, if you don't know what that is, let me kind of tell you, kind of give you a little background of that because you need to understand where the church started and how the church started because Daphne was uh, in Greek mythology because they were Greeks, they believed Greek mythology. Daphne was a nymph in Greek mythology and Daphne is the nymph that was so beautiful to Apollo 
and not necessarily because Apollo really thought she was beautiful. Apollo in Greek mythology ran his mouth all the time. You, you know people like that, right? And so Apollo, the son of Zeus, became smitten by Daphne. Well, the reason he became sent by Daphne is because there was this other cat there uh, that he was poking fun at that the Greeks called the god of Eros, is which is where we get the word erotic, or you may know him as Cupid, right? And so here you have Apollos. He's going, dude, you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with an arrow, man. Come on, you're terrible. And Cupid goes, oh, really? Pow, right in the honey. Gets him. And he is smitten. It's, it's a really incredible story. He gets eyes on Daphne. He was on the prowl. And Daphne was concerned, as, as you know. So she cried out for help from her daddy. And so her daddy turned her into a lotus bush because that's what you do. <laughs> it's brilliant. I'm not kidding you. And they believed this was going on, right? This is what they believed. And so just outside of the city of Antioch, about five miles outside of the city, there was this massive and well-known temple of Daphne. And so here's what would happen. These guys would go out and luxurious immorality. The boys would come to town. They'd watch the chariot races. They would go out to the temple of Daphne, about five miles outside of town. And then you could pay to chase temple prostitutes around, reenacting the story of Eros. And yeah, this is a pagan city. And this is where the church started. Isn't that amazing? So, so here we have these guys going out into the darkest place possible. And this is where the church began. In fact, it, it's been said in, that, that when uh, in the world, there's, if you have a loose girl, that she has the morals of Daphne, which means that she's ready and available. I mean, this is how big this city is. It's Vegas. And this is where the church began. You see, when God's trying to start a light for the world, he's not intimidated by darkness. In fact, it was Jesus that took his disciples to this thing called the gates of hell. It was a real place. It wasn't just a metaphor. It's a real place that they had there. And he takes his disciples there, and there's this gate, this big abyss, led to the mouth of the Jordan River. They thought it was a bottomless pit, and it was called the gates of hell. And, and men, again, would sleep with prostitutes. They, they really enjoyed that. Anyway, and there was this act of worship, and Jesus said, he's sitting there looking at us, hey, boys, I, I know it's just me and you 12, and one of you's a traitor, but listen to me, there's going to be a day not long from now, there's a this guy in Hawkins named Crouch. He's going to be preaching, and these gates aren't going to be here because what I'm starting, man, it, this ain't going to stand, boys. It's a church, and what I'm building, the gates of hell cannot stand against it. Jesus is not afraid of darkness. So listen, I don't care how, where you are this morning. You need to hear this, how dark it is, how hopeless of a situation you're in. Listen to me. When God wants to start a great work, he can start it right where you are. All he needs is faithful men and women to say yes, to share the good news of Jesus. So don't lose heart. This is Antioch we're in. And it's a pit of luxurious immorality. But yet something sticks to happen. Look at verse 21. It says, the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. They believed and turned. The Lord's hand was with them. This is just a group of guys who don't even know their name. They just went out. You want to be effective this week? Then pray this prayer. Lord, I want to share the good news of Jesus. Would you be with me? And then go do it. Go do it. You go, well, I don't know everything. No, 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 no. Just share the good news of Jesus. That's all those guys did. They just went and shared the good news of Jesus, and I'll be. They believed. Isn't that amazing? There was no discipleship program at this point. We're fixing to see it in just a minute. They just went and shared the good news of Jesus. The Jesus of Nazareth. We don't need this anymore. We don't need the, the blood of bulls and goats and priests. Jesus is the high priest. And lo and behold, they believed. It's an amazing story. So go on. Pray that tomorrow. You know, Paul figured this out. It was his life mission statement in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. He says, we proclaim him. We're telling the good news, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in who? Christ. This is the good news. And look what he says. For this purpose, I labor. Now, I may be a tent maker. I sell tents, man. I do what I got to do. But it's for this purpose that I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works in me. And I know some of you are going, I get that. But I'm not Paul. Well, guess what? You don't have to be. 
You don't have to be. You can be some random guy or gal from Cyprus or Cyrene, man, who shares the good news of Jesus, amen? You don't have to be Paul. I mean, that's all Paul was, a random guy that Jesus got a hold of. Come on, church. You don't have to be somebody you're not. Share the good news. Change your Antioch. Be faithful. So back to the story. The church in Jerusalem heard about all these Gentiles coming to faith, and they was like, man, we got to send somebody down there. So they sent Barnabas. Get up there and see what's going on. Look at this. In, in, in Acts 11, 22 and 23, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. I mean, here's Barnabas. He's kind of like Bob Goff today, if you know who Bob Goff is, man. This is a guy that loves to encourage me. Barnabas said, dude, I see Jesus all over y'all. Keep going. Come on, boys. This is awesome. But he also knew this, enthusiasm will only get you so far. And so he started thinking, listen, man, these guys are incredible because he knows what Proverbs says. Proverbs 8, 19, 2 says, enthusiasm without knowledge is no good, at least to destruction. So he said, man, I got to get these boys some help. I got to get these boys disciple. And he started thinking, who do I know? Who would be the right guy for this? And he started thinking, and he's a man, he's a sharp dude. And you know, you know, I met a guy not too long ago, that guy down in Syria and Damascus, I hung out with him, Saul. I got to go find Saul. I got to go get him. So here's what happened. He finds Saul and he sends him back to Acts. In Acts 24, 26, look at it. It says, he, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas, he went to Tarsus and he looked for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And for a whole year, did you hear that, church? For a whole year, he taught them. Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples, Apples were called Christians first at Antioch, the most immoral city of the day. And the first people to ever be called Christians came out of Antioch. And you want to know why? It's not because they went to church. It's not because they, they walked the aisle. It's not even because they came to church because there was nothing else to do today. I'll tell you why they sort of called Christians. Because they studied God's word and they were taught and they started to look like and act like Jesus. And they called them little Christians. <laughs> they just didn't have some conversion. They just didn't walk the out of revival. No, listen to me. They were taught. They were discipled. Listen, that's why we talk about small groups around here so much. Because enthusiasm will only get you so far. You need to be discipled, man, brought along. Even disciplined when wrong. Even taught the word of God. Admonished when you're unruly. You ever been around them, huh, at the church? Amen. Be encouraged when you're faint-hearted to help when they're weak. Listen, if that didn't happen, let me tell you what will happen. If when you're not discipled, your marriages are going to struggle. Your morals are going to struggle. Your relationships are going to struggle. Your kids are going to go to church, but they're going to have a sad faith, not a saving faith. You see, that's why we talk about small groups, and that's why Barnabas looked around, and he said, man, I'm telling you, we got to get these guys some help. And for a full year, they discipled those guys. I was thinking about this last week, about little Christians, and I love this logic from Gandhi. Look at this. He says, I love you, Christ. I just have a hard time with, you, with your Christians, because your Christians aren't what Christ said they should be. And I question whether your Christ is really your Christ. If all your Christians were like Christ, I would go, that is the man, and I like his men. But I don't see his men doing anything like he did. Therefore, maybe that's not the man. It's not bad logic. I think that's why Jesus said that by all this, men will know that you're my disciples. If you're little Jesuses. In other words, you act like him. You love one another. The same way he's loved us. My, how the church would change. You see, the church at Antioch was discipled. And if you jump two chapters over in Acts chapter 13, we see the first missionary journey take place. And then there's a second, and there's a third, and there's many more. And we're here today because just a group of men that we don't even know their name went out. And lo and behold, they said yes. And we're here today because of those guys. You see, the church at Antioch started with what seemed like a little decision. And here we are in Hawkins, America, and the gates of hell don't stand against us. 
because of the gospel. You see, Summit Heights was started over 16 years ago. As I told you that we exist to connect people to God through salvation. That's all about relationship. We want, listen, if you're visiting today or you've been hanging out with us over the last few months, we're so glad you're here. But listen to me, at some point we want you to know that Jesus loves you and he wants a relationship with you that he wants, he wants to give you forgiveness. All you got to do is receive it and you can be saved. And you can enter into a relationship with God. But see, we also exist that once you're in the kingdom, we want you to be discipled. And so we want to connect you to other like-minded people who are growing in their faith as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. But in order for all that to happen today, over 600 people called this place home with all of our services we offer during the week. And if you added up all the people that only show up once a month or once every eight weeks, it's a thousand plus people that call this place home. Listen to me. The reason this place exist because 16 years ago a group of people decided to take a step and some of you don't even know who they are some of you don't remember some of you hadn't been here that long but in order for all of this to happen there's a thousand things that happen that must happen every week people serve that people say yes in fact I want to share a couple of folks with you that you may not know but their faithfulness Week in, week out, sometimes every night of the week, it's Norm and Patty Page sitting right here on the third row. Amen? Let me, t- let me tell you, some, some of you may not even know them, but I'm gonna tell you about this couple. They serve in our preschool area in our child care. And I'm gonna tell you something, you couldn't pay me $200,000 a year to do what they do. Amen? <laughs> I'm just telling you, I, I don't know how y'all do what you do. I, I, tell, I, I would drink a way more than I do. I'm just, it's just crazy. They're faithful. And you see, some of you didn't even know them. But yet, week in, week out, I'll pull the cameras up every once in a while. We have cameras all over this building. And, and I'll just kind of glance in different things of what's going on. And I see your faithfulness. And I'm grateful for you. Because we couldn't do what we do without y'all. There's a guy named Jess Holderman. I don't know if Jess is here this morning. And um, maybe you don't know that every Monday morning, Jess comes up. And all those little cards in the back of your chairs that you see, Jess restocks this room. And most of you don't even know who Jess is because you never see him. In fact, Jess not only restocks the chairs, Jess cleans up all the coffee bar area and washes out all of our coffee pots of all that stuff you enjoy. And then he cleans up all the communion because we take communion every Sunday with these tables in the front and the back. And he cleans everything up and gets it ready. And we couldn't do what we do around here without Jess. And I'm so grateful for people that most of you don't even know But there's a group of people here serving today on our safety team. And you may not even notice those guys. And I love those guys because they keep a watchful eye on what's going on all around this building. While we're in here being fed the word of God. Getting to worship. While our children are back there. While our preschool is back there. And they're here every night of the week that something's going on. To give a watchful watchman on the wall just to make sure they're doing it. And you know what? Most of you don't even know their names. It's incredible of what goes on around here. There's a group that prays every Monday. There's a group that changes diapers and rocks babies. There's there's groups of people here that serve meals and pack backpacks every Wednesday morning. They'll pack backpacks and take them to the school so that so kids can go home on the weekend with food. They'll take out the trash, vacuum, teach, you name it. There's so many little things that an army of people that make a small decision to serve and to love. Little Christians. Because you matter. In fact, I want to do this. I did this in the first service. If you serve in any way at Summit Heights, would you stand? It doesn't matter what you do. If you serve, just stand up. Everybody, come on. Yeah. Amen. Hey, if you're standing, stay standing for just a minute. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Thank you. I mean it. Thank you. We could not do what we do around here without you. You matter. Your decision to take that step to serve matters, and I'm grateful for you. Y'all give them another hand. Amen. (laughs) Let me close with this story. I I was looking at this last week, and I'm just amazed at what happens when people say yes. There's a story in John chapter 2, and it's one of Jesus' first miracles. It's where he turns water to wine. And man, Methodist and Presbyterians and, you know, all whiskey pagans, Lutherans, they love this, Baptist, Assembly of God. Um, it's this great story. And I'm, I just want to equally offend if I didn't name your group, okay? Um, uh, John chapter 2, 
Jesus is doing this miracle and he and his mom are at this wedding. And, and, and in fact, let's just read it, look at it. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Isn't that amazing? Jesus gets invited to a party. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not come. And his mama said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing. You don't drink out of these, it's for washing. Each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now watch this. This is what got me this week. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars. Fill the jars. Fill them with water. What if they didn't? I, I, Jesus, I'm, I'm not a water boy. I, I, I'm a teacher. Jesus, I'm not a water boy. I'm not a water girl. Uh, we have a team for that. Let me call them. I'm too important to do that. J J Jesus, no, 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 no. I'm busy. I'm at a party. Fill the jars of water. So they filled them to the brim. All six of them. <laughs> That's a lot. Then he later said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And, and can you imagine what they're thinking? We're going to take water to a party. So they did it. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. That a simple step, a decision that you would go, come on, Jesus, really? Nobody wants water at a wedding? Are you crazy, man? Are you, you want me to serve water? These are ceremonial washing basins, by the way. People are like, fill them up. Just, just, just fill them up and see what I'm going to do. So simple, so insignificant, really that, that doesn't, just fill them up boys, fill them up. And they did it. And it's extraordinary. Every decision has a consequence. Every decision has consequences. And what's amazing is what can be done if we will simply trust him enough to do the simple things that result in the extraordinary things. So here's my encouragement. A group of men that no one knew went out and did a simple thing. They shared the good news of Jesus. And lo and behold, they believed. And I'm just blown away by that, that a revolution began that day. I don't know their name. I don't need to know their name. I'm grateful. So here's the big takeaway for you. What simple thing, maybe things, is Jesus asking you to do? And go do it. What simple thing is Jesus asking you to do? And go do it. So I am so grateful that so many that stood while ago and stood in the first service made a decision to serve. I was coming home yesterday from fishing. And my son looked at me and, excuse me, let me rephrase that. I came home from casting um, <laughs> and catching any fish. But uh, <laughs> we're driving by the church and there were cars all over the church parking lot. He said, Dad, what's going on up there? I'm like, I don't know. He said, what do you mean you don't know? Dad, what's going on at the church? I'm like, son, I don't know. Well, why don't you know? I don't know, son. Cars all over the front. He said, well, don't you own that place? <laughs> Time out. Stop, stop. No, no. Well, you're at least the boss. You ought to know what's going on. You know what's amazing? Is I don't have to because of you because of your faithfulness, that I don't have to be involved in everything. Because you know what? This isn't Edward's church. This isn't the elder's church. This is Jesus' church, and he's our pastor, and he's our shepherd, and we get to serve under that. Amen? So, so listen to me. Here's what I would say. No matter how small or insignificant that, that request is from Jesus, just go do it. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. People are going to get fed. They're going to get saved. They're going to get served. They're going to get changed. And the opera, this community is going to get rocked, man. And they don't even know your name. Even better that they don't know your name. But may they know the name of Jesus 
And we're here today because a group of guys, we didn't know their name, made a decision to just go and tell the good news about Jesus. So what's Jesus asking you to do? Go change your Antioch. Amen? Let's pray together. Well, Father, I love you. Thank you that we can be discipled, that we can serve, that we can love the unlovable, that you saved us. Thank you for those men that we don't know their names. We just know they did. And we're here today because of their effort. That first missionary journey, just a couple of chapters took place and the gospel spread all over the world just because men and women said yes. So God, I pray today for the courage for those of us that call ourselves Christians. We would ask that question, God, what's that one thing? Maybe two, but what's that one thing? And God, that we would go do that. That we would change our Antioch right here in Hawkins, America and the surrounding area that we would change our Antioch. Lord, I pray for that one here this morning that doesn't know you. And God, that for the first time it's clicked. That's you opening their heart. That they realize you love them. They realize their sin separates them from you. And that Jesus died creating a way so that you could be saved. God, I pray for that one that may be sitting here this morning. In just a moment when we respond and we take communion and people move all over this room, I pray for that one or that two. And I just agree with Alan right now. I know he, he was playing and joking during the offering. God, I would pray for a day that we didn't hit to preach, that we could just baptize those who are proclaiming the name of Jesus. So daddy, do it again. We would ask that, but I pray it would start today with this one or two or three or maybe four that would say, I need Jesus today. Give them courage to grab one of these prayer team members, one of these elders, that they may profess the name of Jesus Christ. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for those men. And God, thank you for these men and women that serve faithfully. I love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, let's stand together. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.